yeah, thank you everyone for uh, for joining today. Um, so uh, maybe some of you came to the first meetup that we hosted um, a couple of months ago, back in May. Uh, that was the first episode of this new series that we're rolling out with, uh, called the C++ series, aptly named. Um, so Iowa Associates, uh, that's who me and my colleague uh, Sam work for. Uh, we're a um, IT and engineering specialist recruitment agency covering the entirety of the UK, uh, pretty much the full spectrum of IT and engineering roles. Specifically, me and Sam focus on uh, C++ positions across the Southeast. Uh, as a agency, we've been hosting meetups across various programming languages for uh, several years now, uh, including uh, .NET, uh, JavaScript. We also host a data one. Uh, which have been well received and we've had great success with both on uh, both on a virtual um, uh, with virtual events and face to face networking events. Uh, so we wanted to bring one to the C++ community. So, yeah, we had our first episode uh, back in May with John Lacos, uh, amongst uh, a couple of others who gave a talk. Uh, so this is the second episode and what we hope will be a continuing series. Um, and yeah, today we have uh, two speakers. Uh, our first speaker will be Ofek Shillam, uh, who's really kindly uh, offered to, to give a talk. Uh, some of you may uh, recognize Ofek um, if you have attended uh, the CPPCon or C++ on C in the past. Um, he also has some of his talks on YouTube as well. Um, so yeah, Ofek is uh, currently a senior developer at Toga Networks, and he will be covering uh, today a topic on uh, everything I wish they told me about Linkers, which is an in-depth survey of shared libraries, build and usage on Linux and Windows with emphasis on implications for developers. So yeah, I think without further ado, um, I think Ofek, I'm going to hand over to you uh, to do your thing. So. Yeah, thank you everyone again for attending and um, yeah, Ofek, uh, whenever you're ready. Right, let's uh, go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for having me here. Um, uh, please note everyone, I, uh, I, I could encourage uh, questions uh, throughout the talk. Uh, I will try to catch them uh, from the chat. Um, I don't do this uh, in actual real time, I will and make some stations, some stops along the way to uh, encourage questions and to catch. Uh, my audio is quite low, is it? Well, it is a little bit, actually, yeah. Ofek, yeah. It's a little bit muffled, um, if there's anything you can do there. Um, let me try. I'm wondering, would it be easier without headphones? That's... We can try that. Are there other countries currently involved, or is it just the UK? I'm uh, talking from Israel. I think headphones might be a little bit better. Maybe the microphone was a little bit further away from um if it was a bit closer to yourself then it might make it a little bit better uh sorry come again was it better uh, previously oh it's better now i'd say that was a bit clearer oh, okay. okay so let's go ahead okay uh the original title of the talk indeed was everything i wish they told me about linkers but while preparing it i realized uh this can't be a uh, actually true. I will not be discussing everything I wish you told me about linkers. Um, I will say quite a bit about loaders too, and I, I had to narrow down the scope to focus on shared libraries and specifically on Linux and window, Windows um, idiosyncrasies. I spent most of my career working uh, on Windows development, and the transition to Linux uh, a few years ago was rather hard. A lot of cheese moved around um, and shared libraries were a particular pain point. So this is quite literally the talk I wish I could have attended 
few years ago. My name is Ofek Shilon. I'm a senior developer at Toga Networks. I'm available by the handle Ofek Shilon at the, all major platforms. And uh, let it be said that I am not a linker or loaded developer by any stretch of the imagination. So you're very, you're very welcome to challenge uh, the views and understanding that I express in this talk. Okay, let's dedicate three slides for a crash uh, course in linkage. In the C++ build model, we start with uh, source files. In the first step, the compiler processes them into object files. Object file is nothing more than a container for sections. Section can contain mach either machine code or data in various forms. Uh, and in the next step, the linker processes uh, object files into a binary, either an executable or a library. It does so by pulling together uh, identically named sections from the object files and unifying them into a larger section in the binary. Another thing the linker does is it reorders the sections in, uh, so that sections with similar runtime required permissions are consecutive on disk. Such a consecutive uh, sequence of sections is called a segment. And in the third and final phase, the loader, the component that runs when we actually start the program, uh, maps these segments into memory on page aligned boundaries uh, and grants uh, permissions as appropriate. Uh, for example, code sections uh, have read execute permissions. Uh, writable data, mutable data uh, segments have read write permissions, etc. Now let's talk about calls. Code makes lots of calls. Uh, the simplest case may be a code, a call from a code section into itself, but that is not the general case. In general, uh, the loader loads and maps to the process memory shared libraries, and code can make calls into these shared libraries. Furthermore, uh, code from these shared libraries can make calls into functions implemented in yet other shared libraries. And arguably the most important job of both the linker and the loader is to properly wire these calls. Now, how might such wiring look like? So uh, in a bit of pseudo code, um, code can call some function bar whose position in memory is yet unknown at build time, certainly at compile time, but sometimes even in a uh, link time. And this is not the way uh, such a call is encoded in actual binaries. In actual binaries, this call is encoded as a call to a placeholder of all zeros, and in a separate location in the binary, uh, uh, we store, uh, the, the compiler stores a small recipe into what to do uh, with this placeholder at load time. A recipe of the form, find the function bar, and when you do, write its address over this zero's placeholder. This small recipe is called a relocation. Actually, in Windows jargon, this is sometimes called fix up. But both in Windows and in Linux, uh, these uh, recipes are stored in a section called dot relock. This is not the truth, uh, but this is good enough to start on. We will refine this image in a few steps as we go on. Few words about terminology. Uh, shared libraries in Windows are called DLLs for dynamically load libraries. Uh, they are called SOs in Linux for shared objects. 
I will try to say binary when I mean either executable or shared library, and I will try to say symbol when I mean either function or a global variable. Um, feel very free to correct me if uh, I slip. Okay, let's go into some details. First on Windows. Just a second, let's uh, have a quick stop for questions. Are there any questions so far? None that I can see. Okay, let's discuss Windows. In a Windows binary, uh, the information about dependent libraries and functions is encoded in a section called iData, i for import. The main data structure in the iData section is called a directory table. Directory table uh, is nothing more than a container for directory entries. Each directory entry encodes uh, information about imports from a specific DLL. Contains the DLL name and then uh, an offset into an import lookup table and an offset into an import address table. Import lookup table encodes information about uh, which functions to find and how to find them in this DLL. And watch these, once these functions, well, symbols, functions or variables are found, the resolved addresses are stored in the import address table. This is essentially a list of addresses, of resolved addresses. Let's talk a bit, uh, ah, right. Uh, um, actually, sometimes, uh, uh, some time ago, uh, the ILT, the import lookup table was moved from the iData to the R data section. Today, it's sitting in R data section. This is a read-only data uh, in uh, Windows binaries most likely for uh, security reasons. It is immutable. The instructions on uh, how to find functions uh, do not change at runtime. So an executable um, contains iData section with lookup table and address table. Say we built a DLL with a function f that we want to consume in this executable. We decorate in Windows, we decorate this function with decalspec DLL export, which causes uh, the formation of an entry in the E data section, E for export. This is a code section, it contains executable code. And uh, the generated entry for F is a stub called imp F, imp for import that contains uh, only a jump into the actual implementation of F. Alongside this DLL, when we build one on Windows, an import library is formed. This is a static lib, which is intended to be merged into the executable, to be statically linked into the executable. When we link the executable against this static lib, against this import lib, uh, its contents are merged into the executable. And in particular, um, a directory entry is merged into the iData section. This directory entry contains um, uh, an ILT entry and uh, uh, import lookup table entry, which essentially says find DLL1 and uh, when you do extract from it the stub imp f. If we have here some pseudocode, uh, some uh, C code or C++ code that calls f, it is in fact compiled into a call to a, an indirect call into the name symbol imp f. This is a name of a slot in the IAT. This is the name of a slot in this list of resolved addresses. 
at load time, the loader indeed locates DLL1, extracts from it imp f, finds its address, say it's a f789, it writes this address into the IAT, and at runtime, uh, when this call is actually invoked, execution is transferred to this stub and from it will implementation. <clears throat> Big breath. The takeaway from this junk rather simple. In Windows, a binary exposes one interface per shared library. The iData contains an interface that says from lib1 import these symbols, from lib2 import these symbols. As we will see now, this is not the case in Linux, in ELF-based uh, operating systems. Linux binaries uh, contains not uh, one section describing import, but two. A section called dot dynamic contains a pool of shared lib names. A section called dot dinsim contains just a list of uh, symbol names, functions or global variables. So schematically, this is very different. Uh, Windows executables uh, did advertise to the world, uh, I'm sorry, Windows binaries, uh, did advertise to the world a mapping from a shared lib to the symbols to be consumed from it. Uh, this is not the case of Linux. We have a pool of uh, shared lib names and a separate pools of symbols to locate anywhere within them. This basic difference in design, you can already see, might have some far-reaching implication to developers. Um, for example, it is no longer guaranteed uh, if you are working on Linux that a specific symbol would be actually imported from the library that you intended, intended for it to be imported from. On the plus side, this behavior might be, um, might be intentional. You might have uh, intended, for example, to override some uh, implementation of a function even in a, say, in a third party uh, SO with your own. More on that soon. So since uh, in Linux, uh, binary does not encode a mapping uh, between libraries and uh, symbol names, an extra resolution step is in order. In Linux, uh, the loader needs to decide from which uh, libraries to import which symbols. Uh, one factor in uh, this decision is the search order, not only for executables, but also for shared libraries. Shared libraries can and uh, almost always do import uh, functions and variables from other shared libraries. The main thing to note here is that when resolving uh, symbols from a shared library, when resolving a shared library's dependencies, the executable is searched certainly before these dependencies, but even before the current library. Uh, there are build switches that can uh, control this behavior, but this is the default. If, uh, let me repeat that, this is important. Uh, if the code here uh, implements some function f and somewhere else in the, in the code f is called, uh, in Linux, the loader would first search the implementation of f in the executable. Okay, we've gathered, we've gathered enough knowledge to discuss the first practical implication. Can we form a process-wide singleton? 
by singleton, I mean either uh, data or code. In Linux, the answer is very simple. It is a resounding yes. Just put the definition of your singleton in the executable, and the loader would pick it up first from anywhere in the process memory, both in the, both in the executable and from shared libraries. In Windows, not so much. If you want a process-wide singleton, you'd have to implement it in your own DLL and have all binaries in the system, all binaries that consume, that are intended to consume the singleton, relink against your new DLL that implements this singleton. Another thing to note about this resolution step, about the decision made by the loader from which library to import each symbol is when it happens. When linking an executable, this resolution is checked at link time. An executable would refuse to link if, uh, say, the symbol G2 on any dependent shared libraries. This is not the case when linking shared libraries. A shared library will happily link away even if none of these listed dependencies implement uh, one of these uh, symbols. Uh, uh, one uh, immediate reason is that uh, these symbols could be implemented in a place that isn't visible. Uh, during linking of the uh, shared library, for example, in the executable. Um, this uh, behavior is dictated, dictated by the implicit uh, defaults which allow Schlib undefined, allow shared libs to use undefined symbols. You can control it with other build switches, the simplest being uh, no allow shlib undefined. Uh, there are some uh, delicate uh, differences in behavior of this switch among linkers, and there are other. circular library dependencies. That is to say, can we have a shared lib A import library, uh, consume symbols from shared lib B and shared lib B consume symbols from shared lib A? In Linux, the answer is yes. You don't have to do anything in particular to make this work. Uh, you just, uh, you just list the libraries uh, as uh, uh, mutual dependencies and uh, you're good to go. In Windows, the answer is no. Well, not easily. Um, I was eventual, eventually able to hack something, but I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, now, let it be said that, uh, you know, circular library dependencies sound like a bad thing, but it was actually very useful to me uh, at my previous work. We had a very large code base and we partitioned it into shared libraries semi-arbitrarily. We just didn't think about it too much. We didn't want uh, uh, we wanted to enjoy the parallelization of uh, linking. And when we changed something, we didn't want uh, an entire million lines of code to relink. We just wanted the neighborhood of this change to uh, have to be relinked. So some, someone some time ago devised some partition and no one gave it any thought further. But, um, Despite having benefited from this ability, I don't like it. I don't like this Windows, this uh, Linux design. Um, I don't like a system that 
encourages me to be sloppy. If we would have worked on windows, we would have to invest thought into the layering architecture of our application would probably have benefited us in the long run. Uh, I recently discovered that uh, I'm not alone in the, this opinion. Here is a quote by one a venerable contributor to uh, LLVM, both, both to Clang and to LLD. Allow sleep that defined is an unfortunate default for shared libraries. Changing it uh, is not feasible today. Mac and Windows have, but this may be a place where they got it right. Okay, so what do we have until now about Linux? We know that symbol and library dependencies are listed separately. This mandates an additional resolution step, the decision of from which library to uh, import each symbol. For calls from shared libraries, uh, this resolution is deferred to load time, and by default, the executable, the executable is searched first. We come now to what I consider probably the most important uh, implication for developers. Can a shared library symbol be overridden from an executable? Now, uh, overridden or uh, overloaded is a term that is heavily overridden or overloaded. So uh, a new term um, was coined for cross-binary overriding. This is typically called interposition in uh, the Linux documentation or online discussions. So the question is, can a shared library symbol be interposed from an executable? In Windows, no. You can't really do such overriding from an executable, as we said in the other context. You'd have to relink all your components against the DLL implementing uh, your uh, overridden symbol. And even then, uh, calls within the library that originally implemented this symbol would not be replaced. In Linux, the answer is yes. If you put a symbol in an executable, it interposes uh, different implementations of this symbol from shared libraries, even from third party shared libraries. You can intervene in this behavior, but this is the default. And it is interesting to note that um, this uh, um, C++ does have some things to say on the matter. Um, this can count as ODR violation, but I won't go down this route right now. A different, uh, uh, the main place where C++ has something to say on interposition is the clause about new. This is a clause called replacement functions, which says, a C++ program may provide a definition for any of the following uh, memory allocation functions. Here, uh, what follows is a list of flavors of new and delete, uh, regular, aligned, um, uh, placement, new, uh, whatever. The, program, the program's definitions are used instead of the default versions supplied by the implementation. As we've just discussed, well, at least on naive reading of this clause, this is not what happens on Windows. If you put your own definition of new in the program, if you read it as an, an, the executable, but actually anywhere in your program, this does not, this isn't the definition that gets used instead of the default versions supplied by the implementation. Okay, here comes actually the deepest technical section in this talk. Before we go there, are there any questions? What we presented so far? 
I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Um, I wasn't quite sure what we were discussing here, but it appears as though we're discussing the virtuals between Windows and Linux. Now, um, as an engineer, I'm eagerly awaiting for the full demise of Windows. Um, but I'm not quite sure what we're actually here discussing. Well, what are we actually here for? Um, we can probably repeat the first slide. Um, so were you here from the first slide or did you join a few minutes late? No, 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 no. I, and I was here for the linkers and loaders. I was here for that. So are we discussing then linkers and loaders? Or are we discussing, discussing the advantages of doing... Sorry? Sorry? We're discussing linkers and loaders, for what focusing purpose? on shared libraries for what and purpose? Linux Windows uh, differences. I will, be, I will be making... Um, I will be, it will be an opinionated talk. Uh, you're I'm just wondering why, why are we discussing linkers and loaders? Is there a problem with linkers and loaders? Is there no, a new development for linkers and loaders? Well, uh, the short answer is yes and yes. Uh, I, uh, we stopped at the point where I presented one place where uh, one implementation of a loader, of linker and loader, does not agree with the C++ standard, I'd say this qualifies as a problem. And uh, are there developments in linkers and loaders? The answer is a definite yes. You can look at the uh, glibc repo. Uh, that's the place that implements LDSO, the Linux loader. Uh, this is a very active repo. Yeah, I'm I still not... Actually, a, a rather recent development. I'm I'm still not quite sure what this journey is leading towards. Uh, I I must have miscommunicated the uh, the title then. Uh, the reason I'm discussing this is that it was a pain point for me uh, personally, coming from one OS to the other. A lot of things that I had taken for granted uh, were no longer there. Uh, the reason to listen to such a talk is only if you're interested in it. It goes not only for my talk, but for talks in general. If, if, if you're not interested in uh, linkers or loaders on shared libs behavior across operating system, it's perfectly fine. I, I'm, uh, the the reason that I dove in was curiosity. Just the will to, to pick up, uh, to lift hoods where I see them. I hope- Maybe uh, at some, sorry, I have also a question. Maybe at some point you like faced a problem and you faced oh, like, a, yeah. you saw like a different behavior on Linux and Windows. That's why you decided to investigate how linker and loader works in more details. So maybe you could demonstrate and make, maybe you can told us more about what kind of issues you have uh, with linkers on different platforms and the reason why you decided to investigate loader work in more details. That's why actually the reason we have this like a presentation because there was some I problem. I listed the three already and more are coming. Here's one, the behavior of process-wide singletons is uh, rather different. Uh, circular library dependencies that uh, one uh, enjoys even without knowing about in Linux, one does not have on Windows. And uh, mostly interposition is a tool available on Linux and not on Windows. These are all very practical developer facing uh, differences. And at least one more is coming. But by all means, if, if you're not uh, if you're not 
working uh, across uh, operating systems and or are not curious about what happens under the hood in shared libraries, then by all means, Paul, this, this might not be the talk for you. It's perfectly okay. Mm. Okay. Um, let's discuss position independent copy. Um, the best way to start explaining what we mean by position independent code is to describe code which is not position independent. If our code makes a call to a specific address in a memory, this code is not position independent. Had this entire binary been loaded elsewhere in memory, this uh, address would no longer be valid. Um, uh, actually, in x64, such form of call isn't even uh, possible anymore. But, well, not in a single instruction, but anyway, this is not what happens. Here's a different form of a call. A call into a relative offset from the current um, program counter, from the current instruction, uh, well, actually, from the next instruction. This call into a relative offset is position independent. If this binary would have been uh, positioned elsewhere in memory, this offset would have still hold. This happens for some calls on Windows, calls into uh, functions marked as hidden, but this is not the default. The default implementation of position independent code is through an extra level of indirection. An actual call is made indirectly into a specific slot in a section called global offset table or GOT. Um, the GOT is uh, essentially a list of resolved addresses or functions uh, rather similar to the Windows uh, import address table or IAT, uh, but with an important difference, the Windows IAT pertains to imports, to functions implemented in some binary external to the current binary. That is not the case for the GOT. The GOT contains addresses for all uh, functions that are called from within the code in this binary, including internal functions. So when the call is made, uh, the contents of this slot are retrieved and the execution is transferred to this location. This is the default implementation on Linux for position independent code. Uh, and uh, by and large, uh, when uh, you're, uh, re when you're reading the commentation or discussing something in Linux, when, when you read position independent code, this is what they mean. They mean a call through the got, an indirect call through the got. And that still isn't the full truth. It is one step closer. Um, for completeness, let me mention a bit of uh, technicalities. Uh, all shared lib code must be position independent. This is not optional. And yet um, the code that generates position independent code, uh, the, the switch fpic is not implicit for shared libraries. If you try to link a shared library from object files that were built without this code, you get a build error saying recompile with fpic. I think this should have been a default, but it isn't. There are two forms of FPIC, one uppercase and one lowercase. Uh, there is a difference from some esoteric architectures, but for um, x86, x64, and ARM, uh, the main architectures around this, uh, the distinction is mute and uh, is moot. And there's, if you want calls from an executable to be routed through uh, the GOT, you'd have to build it with FPIC. Pi, position independent executable. 
and not fpic position independent code i put here a link uh, into a, a presentation that tries to explain the uh, need for two such switches and uh, honestly if you understand it please explain it to me i don't see why it would be needed let's discuss before we discuss lazy binding are there questions on position independent code no we're good okay a uh, lazy binding, I'm sorry, is the practice of um, postponing the resolution of a function address from the uh, load time of the program to the first actual call of this function. Um, the motivation being that um, typically uh, libraries and executables can import tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands uh, of functions. And in real active uh, code paths, only a small fraction of these are actually called. So by lazy binding, you avoid doing lots of resolution work um, that goes to waste, potentially having major saves in um, load time. By default, uh, all Linux executables, uh, all Linux binaries are loaded with lazy binding. Uh, it is somewhat controllable with the environment variable LD bind now in Windows. Uh, uh, by default, programs are not created with lazy binding. The, the Windows term is um, delay load. And you can uh, add a linker switch that says this binary delay loads such and such DRL. Okay. Um, recall that this is where we left off in our pursuit of the full truth of the flow of a function call. We said that a call happens indirectly and through a slot to the got, a slot in the got. Uh, this uh, is intended um, to keep the uh, code pages, uh, the pages of the code section identical uh, across multiple um, processes, thereby sharing the memory pages of um, the code section. And in addition, the motivation is uh, uh, make interposition easier. If we want to interpose, that is intercept the implementation of some function and replace it with another, now we don't have to do relocations in a myriad of places in the code section. We have to replace a single entry. This is still not the full truth. To facilitate lazy loading, another layer of indirection um, comes into play. And this is the procedure linkage table, the PLT. In reality, when we call a function, the first step is a direct call into the PLT. This slot in the PLT contains an indirect jump into the GOT, into the global offset table. Now, the corresponding slot in the GOT would eventually contain the actual implementation of the function that we wish to call, but initially it doesn't. Initially, this contains uh, the address of somewhere that performs this resolution, of the somewhere that actually locates the function that we need to call. This somewhere is, in fact, yeah, on the first call, when execution transfers to this somewhere, this somewhere is actually the next instruction in the PLT. This is the stub that performs the actual resolution of the symbol. The next uh, two instructions in the PLT contains a call into the loader. Recall, we are not at load time. We are now at the first call time. 
but the loader is still present in the process memory. And the function that resolves uh, the address of the function that we actually want to call resides in the loader. So execution transfers there. The loader actually overwrites the entry of the got. This is not a code section. This is a data section. The loader overrides it with a real implementation of the function. And in all calls from the second and onwards, the address that is retrieved from the got is the address of the actual implementation of the function. This is how lazy binding works in Linux. Almost. This still isn't the full truth. Uh, and, and out of guilt, I would at least mention some details that I uh, omitted. Uh, the first and second entries in the PLT are actually special and uh, an extra hop is made through there uh, on the first call. What I call slot index is actually a relocation index and uh, it indexes into another table in a section called Rela PLT. There are actually two sections called got, what I called got is actually called dot got dot PLT. This encodes addresses of functions to be lazy loaded. There is a section that is actually called got and it contains addresses of uh, global variables. And these are resolved at load time, not on first usage time. And probably um, most importantly, uh, in recent versions of compilers and uh, uh, processors, there is actually another layer of indirection uh, called PLT-SEC. This is used um, to facilitate a security feature by Intel, um, which I want to go into details now, as I'm pretty much out of time. Uh, Okay, probably the last implication I'll have time to discuss is the follows. Here's a clause from the C++ standard. When you compare two pointers, if the pointers are both null, both point to the same function or generally both have the same address, they compare equal. It struck me as odd at first uh, that this even needs to be said, but after learning about the PLT, it struck me as odd that uh, this is even possible. Uh, recall that actual calls are made to a PLT entry and PLTs are different across binaries. We have two calls to a function that uh, lies in uh, uh, some address uh, one, two, three, four. Eventually these calls uh, would route to the same uh, function, but the initial call is made into slots in different tables. The initial calls are to different addresses. And to this end, another rather sophisticated apparatus was devised. Um, to, to make function pointer comparisons work, across all the binaries in the process, we need first to find uh, some canonical place uh, in the process that all binaries uh, can reach uh, and put the address there. And moreover, we need the address that we put there to be one of the, to be such that Invoking it would result in a, a call to the actual function. We do more than compare function pointers. We actually sometimes want to call them. So the choice of a location that is visible from anywhere in the uh, process memory is rather natural. It needs to be some section in the executable. Chosen section is an important one that I have discussed so far. It is the symbol table. Uh, in the symbol table, we allocate uh, an entry for the function f, and the value that we put there is the value corresponding to f 
in the PLT of the executable. If we take the address of a function and from any binary in the process, the address that is taken is this value from the symbol table in the executable. This is the way that, um, that function pointers are compared equal in Linux in the presence of PLT. Um, okay, I will skip on this part. Uh, I will just say that there is not really an analogous uh, facility on uh, Windows. On Windows, um, the addresses of a function, uh, of a delayed load function, before and after calling it, the addresses are actually different. So the address of a function uh, isn't even equal to itself, uh, much less to uh, other places that took the address of this function. Uh, this is true in the, pre in the presence of a delay load, DLL, which is a late addition, sort of a late patch into design, into the design of a Windows uh, linking and loading. Let me skip that in order to at least discuss something about symbol visibility. In Windows, we can decorate a symbol as DLL, as DecalSpec export. This adds the symbol to the e data section and, and makes it visible to external binaries. We can also add, declare a symbol as DecalSpec import. This doesn't do much. This isn't what causes the symbol to be imported. What does that is the uh, merging of a static import lib, but it's a good idea to declare this even for readability. Uh, and most symbols are neither exported nor imported. In Linux, the map of concept is rather different and mapping it to a the Windows terminology is non-trivial. There is no notion of import or export uh, in uh, CPP on, on Linux. There's only public and hidden. When a symbol is public, it goes through uh, the full PLT GOT route. It is available to other libraries and executable, uh, which essentially means it, it's potentially exported. And since uh, its address is uh, uh, used at the got, it is potentially subject to interposition. It is potentially imported. So in Linux, um, if a symbol is public, it is potentially imported and potentially exported. If a symbol is hidden, it is neither. By default in Linux, visibility is public. By default, all symbols go through the longer and more complicated route. You can change this to a, a binary-wide compiler switch or an individual attribute to a function. You can decorate a function with attribute visibility hidden or default. You don't call it public, you call it default. Um, and it is a sad historical accident that the default is public. Let me, um, the reason is that when a symbol is public, when a symbol goes through the uh, PLT, it goes through an indirect jump. If all calls go through uh, an indirect jump, all calls have an overhead that is similar to a virtual function. A while back, it was very fashionable to try and uh, de-virtualize function. Uh, today, it's considered not such a big deal, but in tight loops, in your hot path, it might be. If you have some uh, hot path that is very performance sensitive, you might want to be aware of functions that you call there that are uh, in another binary, 
uh, sorry, uh, that are in the same binary, they should be hidden. Let, let me uh, read this quote verbatim. It is a very good quote. Using this feature, visibility hidden can very substantially improve linking and load times of shared object libraries, produce more optimized code, provide near perfect API export, and prevent symbol clashes. It is strongly recommended that you use this in any shared objects you distribute. This quote is from the GCC MAN page. This is pretty much as official as it gets. It is safe to say that there is a wide consensus today that uh, this is one place where Linux got the defaults wrong. Hidden uh, should have been the default visibility. Okay, I don't think I have time to discuss the loader. Um, I will say something about uh, um, some C++ formalities in the standards. Um, when, you, when you try to discuss in the C++ community clauses such as this one and say, um, well, in the presence of shared libraries, this clause isn't followed, uh, the knee-jerk response of C++ mavens is to say something like, shared libraries are out of scope for the standard. And uh, what people typically mean by this is, I think that this is uh, some joker statement that uh, allows people to not have to, to deal with the real world, with its real shared libraries. Um, and this is, the statement is technically true, but this is not the intention behind it. Uh, Shared li li libraries are out of scope for the standard in the same way that X64 instruction encoding is out of scope for the standard. It is an implementation detail, but the standard phrasing as is should apply to real world programs in the presence of shared libraries. Another thing that uh, I heard when discuss when trying to understand this particular clause is that uh, it's not clear in the standard. There's no uh, actual rigorous definition of uh, program or implementation. What does it mean that um, supplied by the implementation? The implementation a compiler. Is the implementation compiler and linker? Maybe it's compiler and linker and loader and operating system. Loader is not a C++ facility. It is an operating system facility that is entirely cross language. And uh, there is no uh, definition in the standard for such terms. And I think there cannot be, and I cannot imagine uh, any definition that would make this, cl this clause um, uh, 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 applicable to real programs. Uh, and so I submit that this is one place where uh, the C++ standard needs to adjust. Such clauses are dead letter. Uh, uh, places where the loader uh, does not, uh, the loader's behavior does not conform to C++ clauses cannot change. It is far too late for that. And we can try and isolate such places and either drop them all together um, or refine them. So um, in a lesser scope, they would hold in the real world. And I will not discuss this any further now, but uh, I list here a place where I started st uh, one such discussion in the committee mailing list. Uh, you're very welcome to join the conversation. I'd appreciate any opinion on this matter. Okay, I will not discuss things I omitted. And I will put uh, the slides somewhere online for anyone to reach. I'd like to 
uh, call out one resource in particular, Michael Karisk, who until recently um, was the owner of the entire uh, MAN pages for Linux, gives an online uh, workshop, I think three or four days, dedicated entirely to shared libraries on Linux. I did not take this class, but based on another class of him that I did take, I'm sure this one is excellent. Uh, Michael was also kind enough to review an early draft of this talk and gave some uh, valuable comments and shared insights uh, into the contents. Okay, this is all I have time for. Um, if you have any questions, I will be very glad to try and answer. Amazing, thanks for that, um, Ofek. Yeah, any any uh, questions for Ofek on his presentation so far, just before we move on to Connor? Um, so yeah, if you want to unmute or put it in the chat box, we'll give you a couple of minutes and then we'll uh, then we'll move on. But thank you, Ofek, it was really interesting. Thank you very much. Cool. So there will be um, another opportunity for questions, and obviously we can reach out to OFAC as well um, after the presentation. Um, we're now going to be moving on to our final and second speaker, Connor, um, who is going to be providing a really interesting discussion around um, new algorithms in C23. Um, obviously, he's made a number of very important um, additions to the Rangers library that was introduced in C20. Um, I will not go on too much about it, and I will let Connor um, run through everything with you. Um, as always, any questions in there, um, put them in the chat, and I'm sure we'll have some time at the end as well for Connor. But, um, Connor, I will let you take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Could I just get a plus one in the chat that my audio is good? And Folks can hear me. Well, sounds good, my end. And folks can see my screen. I can see it. Hopefully everyone else can. Yeah, we've got a couple there. Perfect. Awesome. All right. Um, welcome to my new algorithms in C23 talk. This is going to be an abridged version of a talk that I've given a couple times. And if at any point folks have questions, feel free to either unmute or if you want to ask them in the chat, uh, I'm monitoring that on my second monitor. So uh, I'm more than happy to answer questions while this talk is going on. My name is Connor Hookstra. Here is going to be a small about me. Um, I've been in the industry for, actually, let me... I guess I have to do this this way. Woo. That was like an accelerated. All right, we'll just do it this way. Um, this is a small about me. I've been in the industry for approximately 10 years, the last four of which have been at NVIDIA. For the entire duration of my career, I've been a professional C++ developer, but I know a plethora of languages and have committed uh, production code and, and several of those, Python, Java, Go, etc. I used to... Uh, Haskell used to be my favorite programming language, so I'm a huge functional programming fan, but more recently I've become a massive array uh, language uh, fan, including languages like APL, BQN, and J, which we'll get to see one array language example in this talk called Q. On top of this, I have a YouTube channel that's been going on for, I guess, six years now. You can find that under code underscore report, and I'm under the same alias on Twitter. I also have a programming languages virtual meetup that covers several different textbooks. Um, I think the first one was structure and interpretation of computer programs, and the most recent is actually two different textbooks. Uh, you can find the link for that. I'll share that in a sec. And uh, most recently, I've been involved in three different podcasts. The one that might be relevant to folks that are watching this talk right now is entitled ADSP. That stands for Algorithms Plus Data Structures Equals Programs. I host that with uh, a good friend and fellow NVIDIAN, uh, Bryce Lelbeck, and we talk about everything from sort of algorithms to data structures to software programming in general. Um, recently, we just finished putting out three different uh, podcasts that we recorded live at C++ on C, which was a conference that took place last month. 
in the UK. So that was a lot of fun. If you're interested, um, you can find links to everything that I just mentioned in a GitHub repository called content. Uh, if you're interested in checking any of that stuff out. Last but not least, there's going to be a bunch of code examples. If you want, under the same uh, content repository under the talks folder, you can navigate to the uh, folder that corresponds to this talk, either at CPP North or C++ on C, and find a file that's called links.md that has uh, explicit links to all of the examples if you want to click along and modify them while this talk's going on. Uh, as mentioned, I've given this talk a couple times, so I gave a 45-minute version at Italian C++ and then two 90-minute versions at C++ on C and CPP North. The main reason I'm mentioning this is if you do want to see the full version, because this is going to be an abridged version, it's probably only going to be 40 or 45 minutes and we'll leave tons of time for questions at the end. These will have been recorded and will be online on the corresponding YouTube channels. Um, all three of these conferences have YouTube channels where you can go and check that out. I would not recommend the Italian C++ one. That one is already online. One, it's roughly the same talk, but the audio quality is not great. So I would wait for either the C++ on C version or the CPP North. So this is a uh, overview of what we're going to be covering today. Um, first, we're going to spend a few minutes going over the algorithm land overview as it exists today in C++ uh, 23. And then we are going to cover two problems. One's just a warm-up problem. And then the second one is basically how we're going to spend the rest of the talk. Note that there are two other examples, but as I mentioned, this is an abridged version of this talk. So if you want to check those out, wait for the two recordings from either C++ on C or C++ North. So how does the algorithm land in C++ look today in C++ 23? This is my mental model for how things exist. And that is that there are three verticals. The first is the C++ 98 iterator algorithm vertical. Hopefully everyone that's watching this talk right now is familiar with these APIs. These are the algorithms you can find in the algorithm header. And also there's a few in the numeric header. And you use these by basically passing a sequence that is defined by two different iterators to each of these algorithms. So you can see on the first line there, find if uh, you pass that a function that is F and then a range that is defined by your two iterators, which typically you're going to see being called with dot begin and dot end. So this has existed since the very first C++ standard in C++ 98. And in C++ 11, 14, 17, even 20, we've been adding algorithms uh, to this sort of uh, group of algorithms as we've been releasing standards. The second vertical was introduced in C++ 20. These are basically the exact same algorithms, but now they're in a new, na new namespace, a nested namespace, stood colon colon, ranges colon colon. And the main difference being is that you no longer need to pass a range or a sequence to these algorithms with iterators. You can just pass the container, which is fantastic because it saves us like more than a double digit number of characters. We lose some of that to the ranges namespace, but a lot of people namespace alias this to STDR or something like that. And there are other slight differences, um, but I'm not going to go into those. Like they typically have to do with the return type that is returned by certain algorithms. So for instance, uh, std mismatch is an algorithm that typically in C++ 98 returns you a pair of iterators. In C++ 20, it returns you a result struct with instead of sort of you having to use std colon colon get to access each of those iterators, you can now just uh, reference them by name, they're named dot you know, in one and in two. But the major difference being is that these semantically are the same, it's just a different API call where you don't need to use the iterator methods in order to pass your range. So these are two things that we're not going to be talking about today. This is just painting sort of the mental model of algorithms as they exist in C++ 23. And the main vertical that we're going to be talking about is the third one here, which is range adapters and factories. So note that in the standard, these are not referred to as algorithms, but I include them in my algorithm mental model because that's how you use them. And so, you know, if you're looking for sort of resources online, sometimes these will be referred to as what they are explicitly called in the standard range adapters and range factories. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be referring to them as algorithms. So this is my mental model, three different verticals, C++ 98 iterator algorithms, C++ 20 range algorithms, and C++ 20 and 23 range adapters and factories. And in today's talk, we're going to be talking about the third vertical, which currently shows five different range adapters. So four of these are from C++ 20, and one of these is from C++ 23, but this is not an exhaustive list. So uh, if we look at a longer list, which is still not exhaustive, there's a few that have been left off, but those are more like the utility range adapters. These ones are what I consider the sort of algorithmic range adapters and factories. So everything in the first column is from C++ 20. 
And everything from the right column is from C23. And anytime you see something in parentheses next to uh, what's on the left of it, this actually technically is not a range adapter, it is a alias. So for instance, elements is a range adapter that given a range of tuple-like things, uh, elements is a templated range adapter where you pass it a compile time integer index, and that'll basically extract the uh, corresponding element from your tuple that corresponds to that index. And keys and values are aliases for elements zero and elements one. So a lot of times if you have an associative container that you've turned into a range and you want to pull out basically the first value in your key value pair, you just make a call to keys. And for adjacent and adjacent transform, we're going to talk about these later, but pairwise and pairwise transform are once again aliases where you are hard coding the compile time integer to two. So we are going to go through these sort of one by one, at least the ones that are introduced in C++23, but I'll, I'll pause here just to see if there's any questions before we hop into looking at some examples. <laughs> Someone in the chat says C++23 is out for blood. It's taking no prisoners. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but uh, yeah, uh, quite entertaining. So we'll go to the next slide, which is basically there's a Godbolt linked in, uh, in the links.md that links to this. So this is working code with GCC 13. We're going to get rid of the headers and the namespaces that are being included here and zoom in for what is really important uh, just so that we have an easier time reading this stuff. So this is basically each of the C++23 range adapters and factories by example. And we're going to go through these uh, one by one. So the first one is chunk. Chunk is a range adapter that basically takes a range and an integer n. In this case, we're using n equal to two, and it basically chunks up your range into a range of ranges where the length of each inner range has the length of the integer that you uh, passed in. And note that uh, it can include partial ranges. So in this example, we have the number zero to four. And when we chunk this by twos, you get the first two, which is zero and one, the second two, which is two and three. And then because we only have one integer left, that just goes in a range by itself. So this is a super useful range. And we actually don't have a ton of uh, algorithms like this or range adapters like this pre C++20. This is what's known as an anamorphic uh, algorithm. It basically goes from a range to a range of ranges. It's it's effectively splitting things. And the only uh, range adapter that we have that's like this is basically the split range adapter that came in C++20. But now we have a few more in C++23. And like I said, feel free to, in the chat, ask any questions if any of this stuff is confusing or you want me to give another example or, or say something more about this. Moving on to the second range adapter is chunk by. Chunk by is very similar to chunk, but instead of taking an integer, it takes a binary predicate. Binary here meaning two arguments and predicate meaning a function that returns a Boolean. And the way that this range adapter works is that anytime the binary predicate returns false, it starts a new sublist. And the arguments that equal to, in this case, is taking, or our binary, binary predicate in general is taking, are adjacent values. So our initial sequence is 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. It first looks at the two elements, 0 and 0, and compares, are they equal to each other? The answer to that is yes, so it moves on. The next two adjacent elements it looks at are 0 and 1. These are not equal to each other, so the predicate returns false, and we start a new list. So effectively, what chunk by equal to is doing is it is creating a range of ranges where each range only contains contiguous equal values. So like I said, very similar to chunk, but chunk takes an integer that sort of just predefines the length of our inner range, whereas chunk by equal to is going to give us sort of, uh, you know, data dependent length inner ranges based on our, our input. The next range adapter that we're going to look at is slide. Slide, similar to chunk, takes an integer, but whereas chunk gave you a range of ranges where the inner ranges weren't overlapping, slide, the inner ranges are overlapping. So in this example, once again, we have the number zero to four, and n is equal to three here. And instead of basically moving, chunking by three and then taking a step of three, we're chunking by three, but then only taking a step by one. So the first, uh, the first range, inner range is going to be zero, one, two. Then we slide one. The next range is going to be one, two, three. The, and then we slide one, and the next range is going to be two, three, four. So 
I consider these sibling algorithms, chunk and slide. And the only difference being the uh, number of elements that you step by when creating a new range. The fourth range adapter from C23 that we're going to take a look at is stride. Stride is similar to slide, um, or it's, it's actually more similar to chunk, but it basically is skipping elements instead of including them all. So here we have the numbers zero to nine, and the stride is going to have an integer that is equal to three. So that means that we are skipping every third element. In certain languages, I believe closure, this is actually called every nth, which I think is a fantastic name for it, because that's exactly how you would describe what this is doing. It's taking every third element. So it starts with zero, then steps three, then it takes the value three, steps another three, takes the value six, et cetera. Note that the main difference between stride when you compare it with slide and chunk is that you end up just with a range of values, not with a range of ranges. Moving on to the next range adapter, this or it's actually not an adapter. This is a factory. Factory. Uh, this is repeat. So repeat just returns you an infinite sequence of the value that you pass it, which is, note is why we're using it with take. So repeat 42 just gives you an infinite sequences sequence of 42s. When you combine this with take five, it gives you a uh, sequence or a range of five values, which are all 42. The other range adapter that came in C20, most of you might be familiar with it in the algorithm version of it is IOTA. IOTA gives you a starting value or takes a starting value and then gives you a sequence of increasing integers by one. Moving on to the next range adapters. Actually, there's a question from Abuka. Does take take the first five or the last five? It takes, that's a great question. It takes the first five. Um, and if you wanted to take the last five, the way you could do this is by piping uh, your, your range to uh, reverse and then doing take five. There are certain languages that have uh, basically something called a uh, take last or a reverse take, which would take the five from the end. But in this case, you would have to reverse it. I don't actually think that would work with repeat because repeat is an infinite, uh, infinite sequence. But if you had a range that wasn't infinite, you could first reverse it and then do a take five. Great question. Moving on to the next two range adapters, which are going to be shown, uh, zip transform is basically a variadic range adapter, mean, meaning it can take any number of arguments, and it takes uh, a number of sequences and an operation that has an arity equal to the number of sequences you passed it. So in this case, we're passing it two sequences that are the same, nums twice, which means that we need to pass uh, the first argument as a function that takes two arguments. So std plus obviously is a binary operation. And it is basically just going to apply this n array operation to our n sequences. So in this case, we're applying plus to each of our uh, two sequences num. So because those started off as 001122, we're basically just adding it to itself, otherwise doubling it. So 001122 becomes 002244. But this can be any operation, it doesn't need to be std plus, it could be std, you know, multiplies, std divides. And we could also increase the number of sequences that we're passing to zip transform. Note though, we would have to change the operation to from binary to either ternary or quaternary, depending on the number of sequences that we pass it. Zip is the sibling algorithm of zip transform that is the exact same thing as zip transform, but it just doesn't take a operation. So it just takes uh, any number of sequences, a variadic number of sequences, and then it combines them into uh, tuples. So you could think of zip as basically zip transform if your operation was make tuple. Um, so in this case, we're just zipping together the sequence uh, zero to two inclusive and one to three inclusive. And then you get back two tuples or pairs that are zero comma one, one comma two, and two comma three. Moving on to the next two, this is adjacent and pairwise. Uh, so note that pairwise is an alias and adjacent is almost identical to slide, except that instead of passing uh, your integer value as a runtime argument, you're passing it as a compile time argument. And instead of getting back a range of ranges, you're getting back a range of tuples. So adjacent to just basically gives you adjacent elements in the form of a range of uh, pairs or two tuples. So if we're looking at the initial sequence zero to three, you're gonna get back, uh, the first pair is gonna be zero one, the next pair is gonna be one two, and the third pair is gonna be two three. And note that pairwise is basically adjacent with uh, the integer, uh, the compile time integer specifying how many adjacent elements you're looking at uh, to be two. So these are exactly equivalent to each other. 
adjacent transform and pairwise transform are the analogs of zip transform as uh, zip transform is to zip as adjacent transform is to adjacent. It once again takes an integer as a compile time value and then also an operation that has the arity equal to the number that you pass as the compile time constant. And then it applies that operation to the adjacent uh, tuple or, or window. So in this case, we're basically taking our, our pairs of values 0, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 3, and adding them together to get 1, 3, and 5. And the reason that we have zip transform and adjacent transform is this is a very, very common pattern. And in order to apply a binary operation to a range or to a tuple, you basically have to hand roll a lambda or some kind of function object that is going to unpack that tuple or unpack that range and then pass that the individual arguments of that range or tuple to your binary operation. But with zip transform and adjacent transform, you can avoid all of that sort of unnecessary noise and just pass the uh, callable, whether that's uh, a Lambda or a function object, and it does that behind the scenes, which is really, really nice. Third last but not least is join with. So we got join in C++ 20, which basically takes a, a range of strings or a range of ranges, and it will concatenate them together or join them together. However, a very frequent thing that you want to do is you want to join strings or join ranges by a delimiter. Uh, however, join did not have an overload for this. And due to sort of backwards compatibility issues, we ended up having to just add a whole new range adapter, which you can pass a delimiter and then it joins your range of strings together. So if we have a an array of cat and dog, we can join those with a delimiter, like comma. And then if we want, we can write that to like a, a dot CSV, which is super common when you're uh, doing this kind of thing. Last, second last but not least is Cartesian product. This is a, you know, 50 cent or 25 cent word for something that's actually quite simple. It's basically just a flattened uh, nested for loop. So given two different ranges, it basically just uh, produces you a range of tuples of every single combination of the elements of each of your ranges. So in this case, we have two ranges, one's a string and one's an iota sequence from zero to one and AZ. And this returns you a range of tuples of every single combination. So if you're ever trying to go from sort of for loop code or nested for loop code to ranges, a lot of the times you need a Cartesian product. And note that Cartesian product is once again, another example of a variadic uh, range adapter, meaning that you can pass any number of sequences. So if we were to add a third sequence here, instead of having a range of two tuples, we'd have a range of three tuples. And last but not least is enumerate. If you are a Python developer or a Rust developer, you probably are already familiar with this function because they are, it's quite popular in those two languages. Uh, enumerate basically given a range is just going to, uh, join each of your elements in that range with the corresponding index in the form of a tuple. So here we have the string APL. And when you enumerate it, you get a range of three tuples where each tuple, the first element in that tuple is the index corresponding to that element. So zero is combined with A, one is combined with P, and two is combined with L. This is super useful if you are trying to use a range-based for loop in C++11 or uh, greater, but you need the index as well. So whenever you run into that case, usually what you end up doing is rolling back to an index-based for loop in order to get access to that index. Well, now you can just basically use a range-based for loop with structured bindings in your range-based for loop combined with enumerate and the range that you're passing, and you can destructure this tuple into an index and the element, and now you don't have to go back to a C++ 98 index-based for loop, which is super, super nice. So I will pause because that was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Are there any questions uh, with respect to sort of the C++ um, 23 range adapters and factories. Another question from Abuka says, can you set the default starting value for enumerate? Fantastic question. The answer to that is no, um, <laughs> which I don't actually, I think you can with Python's enumerate. I'm not sure if you can with Rust's. Um, I have run into this myself where it is because C++ is a zero indexed language. That's the way that enumerate works. But a lot of times you actually want uh, your enumeration to start at one and not zero. 
Um, unfortunately, you are going to have to deal with that in sort of the next operation or range adapter that you pipe to. If it's a transform because you're doing some kind of mapping operation, you're going to have to do a plus one. Maybe in the future, we might get an overloaded version of this that does take a starting value. But um, currently, yeah, the way, uh, the way enumerate works is it's hard coded to be um, zero. Great question, though. Any other questions while we're sort of pausing on this, on this uh, summary screen of all the C++23 range adapters and factories? All right, if you do have questions later, like I said, feel free to leave them in the chat or unmute. Uh, we will keep moving along because we've got lots of stuff to get through. So I, I gave you the hint already, but the question I was about to ask is what is wrong with this slide or what stands out? All of these range adapters or most of them follow a certain pattern, but a couple do not. Does anybody see what that pattern is? I'm sure a few of our, a few of you are thinking it, even if you're not typing it. The pattern is that, exactly. So Robert has the answer. The pattern is that not all of them are using the pipe symbol. And why is that? Is just is that because I made a mistake? And the answer is no, I didn't make a mistake. The ones that aren't using the pipe can't use the pipe. So if I highlight these three, zip transform, zip, and Cartesian product, these are three different variadic range adapters. And because they are variadic, they cannot use the pipe operator, which is highly unfortunate because the style of programming that you typically like to do with these uh, facilities is to pipe up a bunch of operations and then kind of align the pipe so you can read things linearly. But if you're not able to do that, that means you have to go back to sort of your inside out calling mechanism. So we will address this in a tiny bit uh, later in the presentation, but I just wanted to call your attention now that any variadic range adapter that exists in sort of C++ 20 and 23 ranges is not usable with the pipe operator. And we're gonna revisit this in a bit. So good job to Robert and Ian for, for catching that. So uh, this might be the most pedagogically useful slide uh, in this talk. And that is what is the state of this in the three major C++ compilers, GCC, Visual Studio or MSVC and Clang? And the answer to that is GCC 13 has implemented all of these and released them in GCC 13, which came out, I believe in the first week of May, 2023, depending on when you're watching this, if you're watching it later it, uh, online. And uh, there's a question by effect, which I'll get to later, which has to do with uh, runtime overhead of this. Um, MSVC uh, V19.36 has most of these implemented. Um, and I think all of them have been implemented. They just haven't shipped necessarily. And Clang currently in 16.0, which is the most recent version as of this talk, doesn't have any of them. So for more details, you can see here in this table, GCC has all of the range adapters and factories implemented. Clang has none of them. And the ones in yellow, MSVC has implemented and merged into their GitHub repo for the standard library. It just hasn't shipped or at least hasn't shipped and is not working on Gobbled. But depending on if you're on beta right now, you might have actually access to all of this stuff. But probably within a few months, all of these will be implemented for GCC and MSVC. And if you're interested in doing some uh, library work for one of these compilers, um, Clang definitely needs a lot of help because they haven't implemented this stuff yet. So uh, if you are looking to get involved, Clang uh, ranges for C++23 would be a great place. So this brings us to our two examples, which is basically going to be the remainder of this talk. The first one is supposed to just be a warm up. So uh, I'm going to ask some questions. Feel free, like I said, in the chat, if you know the answer. And this is a super simple question that we're going to start by solving in C++ 98 and then sort of move up to the most recent versions in C++. So the question is, given a vector of integers, count the number of negatives in this vector. So this is a C++ 98 solution that starts with a local integer count that we initialize to zero. And we then have an index based for loop where I is our index. And we're gonna check is our current element less than zero? If so, pre-increment our count. And then at the end of this uh, solution, return count. So does anybody know a C++ 11 feature that doesn't change anything really substantial about this solution, but uh, does enable us to write a slightly safer and more modern code? that, as I mentioned, showed up in C++11. Oh, 
OFEC has uh, pointed out something we'll mention later, but uh, Ian, uh, Prasant uh, have both got what I was looking for, and that is the C++11 uh, range-based for loop. So like I said, doesn't change anything substantially about this code, uh, but I think it is a bit safer and a bit more modern, and I definitely prefer this code. So semantically the exact same, but um, you know we can avoid indexes that is sort of unnecessary because all we need is the element in this case. The next slide, I believe, uses uh, C14's function deduce return type. And then we go back to C11 uh, if we're using trailing return type. This is just my preferred way of writing modern uh, C code. And what OFEC pointed out, and I believe Abuka is sort of the answer to the next slide, which is um, how can we improve this? And that's by using the algorithm count if. So count if has existed in C++ since C++ 98. However, we're making use of a Lambda, which those showed up in C++ 11, but this specific Lambda is a generic Lambda, which came in C++ 14. And we're basically just passing our vector uh, to count if using the C begin and C end methods for getting our iterators and then defining a Lambda, which is just comparing with zero. So once again, semantically the same thing that we were doing before, but this is a lot nicer. C14 uh, following Sean parents, you know, don't use uh, raw for loops, uh, use algorithms when you can. And uh, the next change to this code is very small, but it jumps to C20. And that of course is using the ranges uh, version of this algorithm where we no longer need to make a call to C begin and C end our iterator methods. We can just pass the vector as a range, which is much nicer. And I would highly recommend doing this if you are on C20 and have access to these overloads. However, this is kind of irritating code if you're coming from functional programming languages or array languages, because in order to define a function that just compares a number with zero, we have to spell out the syntax for a Lambda in C++, which is two brackets, two parens, two braces, return, auto, or int at least, uh, semicolon. So I have a library that basically makes this a lot easier. This is a, a unary function that you can pass a value to that basically compares something with zero. So the LT stands from stands for less than. Um, I'm not necessarily recommending this code, but if you are looking for, uh, you know, nicer way to write sort of very short, useful functions that show up all over the place. Um, you can check out Blackbird. It's on my uh, GitHub um, page. So inevitably, whenever I show code like this in any one of my talks, someone will say either in the YouTube comments or if they're at the conference, they'll come afterwards uh, and ask a question and they'll say something along the following lines. Loops are easy to read slash understand. Everybody knows them. How come I have to go and learn these algorithms? And up until now, I never really had like the best answer. In my opinion, I think that sure, you have to go learn what the names of the algorithms are. That requires a little bit of work, but it is uh, worth the time to go and learn those because it enables you to communicate at a higher level with your coworkers. However, I now am able to introduce uh, one of my favorite programming problems of all time. And it is very elegantly solved in C23 now with some of the range adapters that um, we now have. And that problem is entitled uh, Sushi for Two. So this was a problem that I first solved in C++ or in 2019. And it was in a code forces contest. So if you're familiar with LeetCode or HackerRank, these are just websites that put on competitive programming contests once or twice a week. Code forces is a site similar to that. And uh, when I went to solve this problem, I actually didn't solve it in C++ because I figured it would, it would be too complicated. And I went and solved it in Haskell. Um, and we're going to show, you know, those solutions later, but first things first, let's explain this problem. So I'm going to ask if you can figure out what the answer, uh, given the problem description. So the problem is you are given two types of fish and you and your friend are going to a restaurant to basically order as much fish as you can. And so you're going to be given a vector of integers and the integers are going to be one and two. One corresponds to one type of fish. We'll say that's the tuna, the blue fish, and two corresponds to another type of fish, which here is the puffer fish. So you're going to be given uh, a, a, a basically a, a vector of these. So a, a list of these. And there are a number of criteria that you have to follow in order to maximize the number of fish that you and your friend eat. So these are the four criteria. Number one, you like tuna and your friend likes puffer fish. So you're only going to eat the fish that you like. Two, you have to both eat the same number of fish. So one person can't eat more or less than the other person. You each have to eat the same amount. Three, when you order and choose your fish, 
you have to choose them in a row. So in a contiguous sequence. So if this is your example, you have to choose a set of uh, fishes or sushis that are contiguous. You can't sort of pick and choose from your list. And fourth and finally, when you choose your sushi from this list, it has to be partitioned. So it has to go tuna, tuna, puffer fish, puffer fish, puffer fish, or puffer fish, puffer fish, tuna, tuna, tuna. It has to be partitioned. So you can't, once again, have a uh, basically a, a contiguous set of sushi that um, alternate more than once. So based on those four criteria, each of you like a different fish, you have to eat the same amount. It has to be contiguous that you take from your list and it has to be partitioned so that you're not swapping more than once. Um, what is the maximum number of uh, sushi that you can eat? So for this uh, example, the answer is four because this is the longest sequence of fish where it's partitioned. It has the same number of tunas and puffer fishes uh, and it is um, contiguous. So it's not, you know, we're not taking also the first uh, piece of fish from the uh, beginning of the list. So hopefully that makes sense, but just to make sure we're going to look at one other example. So if we're to change our example, uh, list of fish, does anybody in the audience or virtual audience, <laughs> I guess I should say, know what the answer for this example is. Waiting still for someone in the chat. Uh, OFEC is definitely correct, and Ian is correct as well. So OFEC said uh, one to seven, meaning these fish, and Ian is saying uh, three each, which is also correct. So each individual, you and your friend, get three correct. So the solution to this question doesn't care about the indices. It just cares about the total uh, count of the fish that you're eating. So in this case, uh, we would return the integer six. Um, so I think Jessen, if you're doing inclusive in one index, that would also be correct. Two, three, four, five, six, or you might be off by one. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and we are now going to look at how to solve this problem, uh, in C++ naively without ranges. So we're not going to go through this in detail because I don't have time, but this is the reason that I avoid solving this problem in C++ is because in order to do it with O1 memory and uh, a linear time solution, you need to basically store four pieces of state. You might be able to get this down to three, um, but the point is, is that there is a bunch of state that you need to keep track of. What's the current piece of sushi that we're looking at? How many in a row have I seen? What's the previous number of sushis of the other type in a row that I saw? And what is the global max of mins, aka sort of the, when you compare the current sushis in a row with the previous sushis in a row, what's the minimum of those two? And what's the global max of those? And then we go through our for loop and we do all our checking of when the sushi changes, you know, you update your state and note that at the very end of this loop, we also have to duplicate some logic because uh, we update our state based on when the sushi changes. So at the end of our list, we still need to check you know, is this the maximum amount that we could eat is at the end, but because our sushi value isn't changing, you need to do something extra. The point is, is that like, this is incredibly confusing in my opinion, and it's not the kind of code that I want to write. And the point of this talk is to show that using C++ 23 ranges, adapters, and factories, we can now write code that looks like this. So I'm not gonna walk through this immediately. We are going to uh, solve this first in a simpler language called Q, and then we're gonna come back to this. But the idea here is to show that this is a much simpler solution that's now possible in C++23 uh, that I am super, super excited about. So first things first, let's solve this problem in Q. So Q is an array programming language. It's quite simple. You don't need to know much about it to understand it. Just note that SF2 is our function sushi for two. And currently this is a function that takes a single argument X and it's currently just the identity function. It's just returning you what you pass in. So if this is our initial list of sushis, uh, tunas and puffer fishes, tuna equals one, puffer fish equals two, we want to find what's the uh, maximum uh, number of sushi that you and your friend can eat. So the first thing we need to do is to call a function called chunk. So chunk is just basically going to do what our chunk by equal to does in C++. It uh, gives you back a sort of list of lists where each sublist contains contiguous equal values. From here, we now basically want to get the length of each of those sublists. 
So if we count each of our chunks, that gives us the length. So count each here is going to return us the length of each of these sublists. So if you look at them, the first one is one, the second one is two, the third one is one, the fourth one is three. We get those values by doing count each of our chunks of X. After this, we basically want to do a min prior. So this paren ampersand paren is the minimum in Q and it, it, it compares adjacent values and takes the minimum of those values. And you might be thinking, why is ampersand used for their minimum function? And that's because uh, ampersand is also logical um, and. And if you think about what logical and is, because in the space, so their Booleans are zeros and ones. If you extend that to integers, logical and is actually the minimum function. So and doubles as both logical and and minimum, which is quite nice. The way that prior works, though, is unfortunately, it's similar to adjacent difference. So uh, prior is what Q calls it. Adjacent difference is what we call this in C++ 98. Haskell calls this map adjacent. Kotlin calls it zip with next. And we're getting a version of this uh, in C++ 23, which I mentioned before, adjacent transform. However, the adjacent different difference and prior functions have the unfortunate behavior that they copy the first value of your input sequence to be the first value of your output sequence. So this one here is actually the one from the very first value here. It doesn't have anything to do with minimums. And that means that uh, we need to get rid of it because in the case that it's a, it's a two uh, or it's the maximum value in our sequence, we're going to end up uh, with the wrong answer. So this one underscore is basically dropping the first element from our list. Once we have this now, we can basically just get the maximum value from our list. And then we multiply that by two, which is going to give us our final answer of four. So if this didn't make complete sense, that's totally okay. Cause we're going to go through this again in C++, which is probably a language all of you are more familiar with. But the point is, is that this is a, a very sort of concise solution that is possible in an array language. And we can now basically spell the exact same thing in C++ 23, just with a different vocabulary and different names for these things. Note that this is the point-free version. We can get rid of the two braces and the X by just adding a double colon at the end. So now back to C++, here's our sushi for two function. And uh, we are going to basically build up the solution to this problem that we saw earlier by uh, following what Q did, and we're just going to spell it in C++. So the first thing that we did in Q was make use of the chunk function. In C++23, we can now spell this with chunk by passing it the binary predicate uh, std colon colon equal to. So note that the chunk in our Q solution hard-coded the binary predicate equal to, whereas here we need to pass it in. So once again, we're just splitting our range uh, into range of ranges, which have contiguous equal values as seen in the example below. Now we want to do the equivalent of our count each, which in C++ we're going to do with our C++ 20 transform range adapter. And instead of using uh, our count function in Q, the way we do this in C++ uh, 20 is using the std colon colon ranges distance function. So this gives us back the distance of our ranges. After this, we want to do the equivalent of our min prior in Q. And as mentioned before, this is called adjacent transform. And uh, we're passing it the compile time integer two in order to compare adjacent values. And then we're taking the minimum of this. Note that if you're gonna try and use the C++ a 98 std colon colon min function, you need to wrap this in a Lambda. I believe, however, um, actually we're, I'll mention that in a sec. There's something nicer that you can do in C++ 20. Um, after this, we basically want to just take the maximum of our list of numbers, which uh, we can do by calling the uh, std ranges max function. And then we just need to multiply this by two and we get our answer four. So hopefully you can see that this is a lot nicer than our um, extremely verbose for loop that we had uh, that we showed you know, several slides ago at the beginning. So that was a lot. Hopefully folks followed. Um, but uh, you might be thinking that there are two irritating things about this code. Uh, in the chat or unmute if you want, uh, name anything irritating that you see about this. I'll wait a few more seconds while people type. Uh, Abuka is 
has gotten the one that I'm looking for, the first one that I'm looking for. And that is that uh, the Lambda is irritating because it'd be nice if we could just pass uh, std min as a function. Um, so someone actually pointed out, and this is a mistake, this should say std min, that uh, std ranges min and max are actually passable as function objects. The reason why std min and std max aren't is because they fail to figure out which version of the function you need. So the function overload resolution doesn't work, but there are new versions of these min and max function objects that exist in C++ 20. So you can pass these. Um, an alternative to this is, uh, and, and Bryce, my, my co-host of my podcast was the one that pointed this out to me. An alternative to this is to make use of uh, my function object in my Blackbird library. And uh, this was shown earlier with the LT function as well. So this is just a binary um, Lambda that takes two arguments. And if you're gonna use this for min, you might as well use it for equal. And uh, this is um, slightly preferable in my opinion because it is nicer. Um, and let's see, in the chat, a few people have uh, pointed things out. None of them have gotten the second thing that I find irritating, which is that unfortunately, uh, we aren't able to pipe to std ranges max. So std ranges max uh, is not overloaded with the pipe operator. Therefore, we need to basically pass the result of our pipeline of chunk by transform and adjacent transform to uh, as an argument to std colon colon ranges max. So there's a couple different options to get around this. Uh, one of them is to make use of a library called Flux. So I'm not sure if anyone in the audience, virtual audience has uh, heard of this library, but it's a library by Tristan Brindle. He was the uh, creator or implementer of a range library called NanoRange. He went on to do a library called Flow, but now his most recent project, and I think what he's spending all of his time and energy on these days is Flux. Flux is basically a uh, amalgamation of his experience implementing these different range like libraries and it's yeah culminated in flux so here they have basically a uh, slightly different syntax you're not overloading the pipe operating you're just making calls to methods and uh, because of this we're able to just go dot max and uh, that's a lot nicer in my opinion however uh, if you don't want to use flux an alternative which is even more um, uh, esoteric or sort of extreme is to switch to a compiler that is a cutting edge compiler called Circle. So Circle has implemented the pipeline operator with the placeholder, uh, which is proposed for C++ 26. We may or may not get that. And that enables you basically to specify where you want the output of your previous operation to go with the dollar sign. Um, so this is super, super nice in my opinion. Obviously, it's not easy to switch to this at work, but um, this is basically like proof of concept that this could work in C++ and we might be getting this in C++ 26. Um, so a little bit more about Circle. Like I said, it's a cutting edge compiler, uh, fully compliant with C++ that is being implemented by an individual by the name of Sean Baxter. We had him on two different episodes of ADSP to talk about, not just about Circle, but also about all the different successor languages like Carbon and CPP Front and Val and what uh, Sean thought of those, obviously, because he has a lot of experience implementing uh, C++ compilers. On top of this though, there are a ton of other links if you wanna go see, um, see stuff instead of listen to stuff. There are talks that he's given at C++ now and different C++ uh, user group meetings. I think he gave a talk at Bloomberg and a talk at the New York C++ meetup. So if you wanna go learn more about Circle, there's tons of resources. Um, and uh, yeah, the point that I basically just wanna highlight is that you can sort of get the pipeline version of this code that we want without having to specify overloads for all of these operations by just getting this language feature, which I really hope we get to see. So note that if you want to go play around with this, it does exist on Compiler Explorer. However, you need to uh, sort of copy and paste uh, this code into the command line arguments. However, that's a lot of work to type this out. So I would just recommend if you go to the links.md file, you can click on the circle Godbolt links and it'll have all that stuff pre-populated for you if you want to go and play around with that. So uh, this is the first solution. And in a longer version of this talk, uh, I go on and I show sort of the Haskell solution. This is the Haskell solution that I solved in uh, 2019. So note that group is the name of our chunk by function. Map length is how you spell transform distance. Map adjacent min is how you spell adjacent transform min. And uh, stood colon colon ranges colon colon max is the equivalent of maximum with our times two at the end. Uh, but if we go back to this code, what I was going to say is that this is an alternative solution. We don't have time to, in this talk, basically go through um, how I built up this. But the main point of building up this code is that this currently is using the circle 
C++ 26 proposed pipeline operator and placeholder. However, if we don't have this due to the fact that variadic ranges don't work with the pipe operator and that here we're, we're basically piping our output into multiple places, right? Here we have sort of $2 signs because we're piping things in twice. If we convert this to standard C++ uh, 23, this is what it ends up looking like. So this is kind of my motivational slide for why we should really want to get this language feature into C++ 26, because I don't think anyone would prefer to write code that looks like this when compared to the previous slide here. I think this is way more readable. It still requires you to go and learn the ranges, but in terms of the linear flow of coding, uh, writing, reading the code from top to bottom, um, the previous is, is much more preferable. That being said, uh, sort of this is the idyllic code in my mind. And I know technically we went over a little bit, but we're gonna sort of speed through. So this was an extra section that if we had time, we were gonna go through, but we are short on time. So I'm just gonna skip through it. Basically, the, the point uh, that I wanted to highlight was that when I gave an earlier version of this talk at Italian C++ and it went online, a YouTuber by the name of OMG Clueless uh, said that I wasn't being fair because I was being clever with the range-based solution, but I wasn't being clever in the for loop-based solution. And they provided their own solution, which if you make nice, looks like this. The very fast version of this is one, this doesn't compile, so you have to fix that. Two, this doesn't even work. You have to fix their code because it fails this test case. Uh, but once you get it compiling and once you get it working, you still have to reformat it. However, this is shorter if we compare it to my solution. So sure, they came up with a shorter solution. But the main problem with this solution is it's making use of pushback. So this solution has ON memory. So the, the summary of the point that I was going to make by showing this sort of digression is that the time complexity of all three solutions that we've looked at, the one from YouTube, my for loop and ranges is linear, but the memory complexity of the one that the YouTube commenter provided is linear, which is suboptimal. You're guaranteed to have linear or sorry, uh, constant memory when using ranges, which is fantastic. Um, it's also a lot more bug prone because of the fact that we had a bug and we didn't even notice it. Um, whenever you're coding in for loops, I would argue that this is more uh, prone to bugs than compared to ranges. In my, in my opinion, this is, you know, just my opinion, ranges is a lot more readable than for loop code. Um, that being said, you have to be familiar with the ranges, similar to having to go and learn the algorithms. You have to go learn them in order for it to be readable. And it's much more declarative. So if you compare solutions, uh, the, the YouTubers one, uh, the YouTube commenters one had one vector and two ints that were being modified. My for loop had four ints that were being modified, but the ranges doesn't have any mutation at all, at least none that is apparent on the screen. There's some happening in the background that the ranges is doing, but we don't have to write that ourselves. And last but not least, uh, the ranges code, in my opinion, is more parallelizable. There are some ranges that aren't as easily parallelizable, but um, in general, I think this kind of uh, pattern code code paradigm is easier to, to accelerate. So this is sort of my last slide. Once again, we should all be super excited that at least in C++23, we can write this code. And uh, that's the end of this digression. And so we're going to go to, uh, in summary, um, these are our C++23 and 23 range adapters. And uh, I would recommend that even if you're not using C++ 23 or 20, you start to familiarize yourself with them because they'll be coming uh, when either at work or in your personal projects, you're able to make use of these compilers. Um, this is the maybe, you know, like I said, most pedagogically useful slide in that it demonstrates in very short examples how each of these range adapters works. Um, this is the summary of, you know, depending on which compiler you're using, what access you have to these different range adapters and factories. Uh, this is a comparison of why I think ranges are so awesome uh, when it talk when it comes to you know avoiding bugs, readability, um, and memory complexity. I think it's just all wins across the board. And uh, last but not least, uh, like I said, you can find links to uh, compiler explorer examples of all the C++ code and circle code. And uh, yeah, get excited about being able to write super modern C++ code either in Circle, where you have access to the pipeline operator, or in C++23, uh, at least in GCC and MSVC, you basically have access to all of this stuff. So with that, I will say thank you. And I think we have a, a few minutes for, for questions, if folks have any. Uh, there's one question from Abuka that says, not on CPP, but what do you use to animate your slides? Uh, so I use Microsoft PowerPoint uh, 2019. If you go to my YouTube channel, or actually if you just go to YouTube and you Google or you YouTube how to make 
beautiful code uh, slides. Uh, I made a YouTube video that's like eight minutes long or 10 minutes long or something that shows a behind the scenes of uh, what goes into uh, those code transitions. It's actually, it's very simple. I'm, I'm not doing anything fancy or, or magical. It's, it's just making use of something that's built into to PowerPoint. I mean, this is not a question, but it's a comment from earlier that I can remark on from OFEC that says debugability suffers. Um, I agree that this is true. However, I think even though debugability suffers, your probability that you're going to write bugs also goes down. And on top of that, if we get reflection in a future C++, there are facilities that exist in other languages like Elixir, where basically you can take a pipeline of operations. I guess I should switch to this to the uh, question slide. It can take a pipeline of operations and then pipe it to this like metaprogramming function that then incrementally outputs what your output of an evaluation of that function is at every stage of the pipeline, which is a very, very nice way to be able to see like where your code is messing up. So it is a little bit harder to debug. I completely agree. But I think when you, I would rather take, um, harder debugability combined with like a much lower probability that you're going to write bugs in the first place, because, you know, it's not going to be in the ranges where you encounter bugs. It's going to be in the function objects or the lambdas that you're passing to, which I think it's, it's easier to identify that stuff um, than it is, you know, just F 10 through for loops and if statements. Uh, but that's just, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, and Ian's mentioning if if you were doing this kind of thing in Lisp, you build the function up in stages and test the output. Yeah, and that's exactly so. When I was showing that sort of line by line construction of the sushi for two function, that's literally how I code that stuff in Compiler Explorer. Because we have C plus plus fourteen's function deduce return type, you can create a function that uses auto, and then. Uh, print that using, uh, we don't have it in C++23 implemented yet, the std colon colon print, but you have access to it in the FMT library. So you can just on Compiler Explorer, include FMT, use the print or print lin function to basically print that function. And as you're building it up, uh, your print function has the ability to print ranges and print values. So you don't need to worry about what the return type is. If you're currently printing out a range or a range of ranges or integer, it'll dynamically like print whatever you give it. And then you can just, it's not the equivalent of like a REPL and Lisp or a REPL and Haskell, but it's, it is the closest thing that you'll ever get to it in C++. So each time you add a range adapter, you basically get to see what the incremental output is versus if you're building up like a for loop and doing a bunch of stuff, sure, you can go and compile it um, and uh, you know check what the result is each time. But usually people write the code and then they compile it once and just look what the output is. So, uh, David's saying, I'm getting a um, 404. Let me copy, let me paste. Um, I just copy and pasted that and it worked on my computer. So, I mean, that's an infamous, uh, you know, computer science problem. It worked on my machine, but, um, yeah, I'm not sure yet what, um, maybe my GitHub is blocked <laughs> if you're through going through a VPN or something. Um, Abuka asks, in terms of code readability, does this not suffer from the same problem as variable initialization, such as, as you are not sure that it may sometimes also look like a function call because there would be multiple possible implementations of the same solution? Um, is your question, I'm, uh, I will assume that what you're trying to ask is that C++ has a problem with you know, the 17 different types of initialization, braced initialization, equal initialization, auto initialization. And you're saying that now we are providing another way to solve problems. And so that's just adding to the proliferation of ways that you can write code in C++ to get the same thing done. I would say that these are entirely different. Like, um, 
initialization, I think is kind of broken in that we added brace and brace initialization, which was supposed to be, you know, quote unquote, uniform initialization, but like we didn't get that right. Most infamously, it's the trying to use an initializer list um, to like declare or to declare a vector of two integers. But when you do that, it's going to instead dispatch to the copy constructor or the, the constructor that takes, you know, two integers, one for the size and one for the value. So there's like use brace initialization and initializer lists, except for in the case when you're, you know, have constructors that it might be ambiguous. That is at all not like the same thing as, you know, ranges. Ranges is uh, a library that exists in many other languages. Java 8 got this in the form of streams. Rust has this in the, in the form of iterators. Elixir has this in the form of streams. I think Clojure has this in the form of transducers. This idea of having a composable library where you can build up a pipeline of functions that are basically just modifying your data. It's kind of like a data flow model. And then ultimately outputting your answer. And it's doing that by fusing the operations, guaranteeing that you have constant time memory. I think that's a completely different model than how you solve this with a for loop. Um, so yeah, that's that would be my answer to the question. However, why MMV, your mileage may vary. Other folks may have different opinions. Also, Sam and uh, Jordan, feel free to cut this off whenever. I know we're over by a few minutes if, um, if we need to wrap this up. No, that's all right, Connor. I think there's, oh, yes, yeah, someone's just. Um... <laughs> oh, yeah, there's. I a... thought that was going to be a question there, but no, I think that's just a nice yeah, comment. The, the final <laughs> comment is uh, C 23 is awesome because it looks just like D. And that's, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, Chabisi knows, probably uh, has insider knowledge that ranges, um, as, even the name ranges, is actually borrowed from D. So D is a, was at one point supposed to be a successor language that was going to compete with C++ that never ended up actually reaching a level of the success anywhere close to C++. But they basically, their whole standard library makes use of this kind of ranges functionality. They don't do the pipeline. They do it with uh, methods and they have universal function call syntax, UFCS, which we do not have in C++. But um, yeah, this the ranges code does end up looking very similar to D code. Uh, because they're basically the same idea. All of those libraries that I mentioned in Java, Rust, et cetera, you can add D ranges to it because, yeah, it's, it's the exact same model. Great. So I thank you, Connor. Well, um, I guess I'll just put out one last request if there's any last questions before we wrap up. Let's give people a few seconds. GitHub link. Yes, sure. I can. Um, or I guess that was a, a private message from Steve, but I can drop the, um, uh, or I guess this was the same one that was mentioned earlier, but I can link specifically to, uh, this is the folder that contains all of the slide deck info. And if you want one to the, um, or except I posted that to just to Steve. So that goes straight to the links.md. And this one goes, I or no, that was the same one. Sorry, I'm link spamming now. And this one goes to the parent folder. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, the, uh, the first get. Uh, GitHub link work for me too. So yeah, hopefully those ones working. Um, but yeah, also just to uh, just so everyone who um, arrived late, I did notice that we had quite a few people uh, sort of coming through it at various times. Uh, we have recorded this this talk, so we will send out to everyone that has registered uh, via the Zoom link or that obviously attended today, and uh, we'll also be putting it out on our um, LinkedIn social and uh, YouTube as well. So yeah, if you did uh, miss any of it, we'll be sending that out. Um, but uh, yeah, um, thank you everyone who attended and thanks again to our speakers, Connor and uh, OFEC. Yeah, really appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to speak at this. This is a, obviously just a free event that we're hosting. So um, yeah, thanks again, guys, for, for taking the time to talk and hopefully everyone um, took some 
something away from this. Uh, we will be looking to organise our next event probably within the next two months. Uh, if anyone has any feedback or uh, ideas about particular topics or speakers that they would like to hear from in future events, then by all means, please do drop us a message. Um, I probably should say that my name's uh, Jordan. I've just realised that my <laughs> my Zoom is uh, saying Michelle, which is our marketing manager. So yeah, uh, either drop myself, Sam, uh, a message or comment in the actual LinkedIn event page as well if you've got any feedback or, or future topics that you'd like to um, to hear about. Uh, but yeah, thanks again, guys, for, for taking the time. Uh, we will get this recording sent out to everyone that attended and uh, we will keep you updated on the on the next episode.